So let's start with me. Um, I uh, work on uh, RNA biology uh, subjects, but uh, uh, the big question that we have in mind when we do our RNA assays is, uh, is this. Um, so this is a, a picture of uh, a splices, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> splices <over. laughs> synaptic, <laughs> synaptic vesico, which, uh, which is a very complicated um, structure, as you can see. Uh, this is artist's representation of it, of, it, of course, but uh, the real thing is even more complicated. So there are a number of proteins decorating it, and they are not just decoration, they are functional things. Without the presence of all of these things, or almost all of them, uh, the synaptic vesicle, which is a good example of a uh, cell-specific organelle, would not be functional. So somewhere, somewhere in the genome, there is an information uh, regulating the expression of this, all of these genes in a coherent manner. So they all have to be expressed at the right time and uh, in the right place. So what, how exactly that happens? That's a question we uh, like to ask. And uh, uh, of course, the story is even more complicated because if you consider neuron and uh, indeed the process of uh, differentiation of neural stem cells in neuron, uh, this cell is substantially different from this one. There are thousands of proteins which are different, and all of them play some sort of functions. And, and in, num in a number of cases, these proteins interact to form complicated uh, molecular machines. So how, how this regulation is achieved? I mean, a bit uh, of information is already out there, but we believe there is a lot of things to be discovered. So what is known is uh, there is transcriptional regulation level, as you know, we all might uh, assume. And uh, I'm showing you just two examples here. Uh, this is a, a very famous uh, transcriptional repressor called REST. Uh, this is a complex that binds to promoters of neuronal genes and make them silent in non-neuronal cells. So this is a, a, a good example of something you might call a master regulator, right? Something that regulates many, some single unit that regulates many things. So another good example of master regulators uh, is a class of basic uh, helix, helix uh, loop helix proteins, uh, which also bind to a number of promoters, but unlike REST, they, they're activators. So they are expressed as uh, neural stem cells differentiate into neurons, and they activate expression of a, a number of neuronal genes. On the top of that, there is also a, post a number of post-transcriptional mechanisms, and this is where our interest lies primarily. So I'm showing you here just two examples, which we like to look at more than uh, other examples. So this is a microRNA pathway, quite famous, small non-coding RNAs encoded as hairpins in uh, genomes of uh, multicellular uh, eukaryotes, uh, processed and uh, um, transported to cy cytoplasm, where they regulate the expression of uh, uh, proteins through translational inhibition or a destabilization of mRNAs in a sequence-specific manner. So this is the a little uh, vignette showing this. And uh, of course, alternative splicing, I'm sure you've heard a number of talks on this subject, uh, and, and, and a number of you also study this. So uh, I guess it's uh, just to remind the rest of us that alternative splicing is a combinatorial uh, reassortment of exons. You know, in eukaryotes, quite often, Ex not, not ag all exons uh, encoded in the gene are included. Sometimes they're skipped. And this is a, indeed is just a um, picture summarizing what kind of uh, possible scenarios are out there. So there is this cassette exon, there's mutually exclusive exons, different splice junctions, uh, different uh, first and last exons, and uh, retained introns. So this process is uh, similarly dif uh, seemingly different but um, work in our lab suggests that there is actually a, a systems biology connection between these two processes, and I will talk quite a bit about uh, this in, during this talk. So uh, the story begins with our interest. Uh, when I was a postdoc, I got interested in this very, uh, very important uh, neuron-specific microRNA that, that is conserved across all metazoan organisms. So this uh, microRNA called MIR-124. This picture shows you an in situ hybridization staining of a mouse embryo where uh, the expression of this microRNA is revealed by um, uh, labeled probes. So you can see a uh, spinal cord quite nicely. These are the, just three different aspects of the same embryo. And the uh, uh, rostral part of the neural uh, T 
tube is stained quite nicely. The cross section of this um, shows you um, a little bit more of detail. And uh, uh, if you know a little bit of uh, uh, neuronal de uh, development uh, um, in, in, in vertebrates, you would recognize that this is a uh, cross section of the spinal cord. And at this point, neural tube consists really of two major layers. One of them is called uh, a neuroepithelial layer where uh, embryonic neural stem cells reside. And this, uh, this is so-called mantle layer where uh, mature neurons or neurons committed to differentiation reside. And uh, this is an excellent system to really tell these two types of cells apart because uh, just by looking at, uh, and uh, here or here you would know what kind of cells you're looking at. So uh, incidentally, this is a microRNA expression pattern that actually reveals this, this particular uh, uh, demarcation between uh, neural stem cells and uh, mature neurons. So you might assume that uh, the levels of this microRNA correlate with the, uh, with the fact that the cell undergoes neuronal differentiation. So this microRNA might, according to this, contribute to neural differentiation. And uh, uh, a work in a number of labs uh, suggests that this is indeed the case. So our contribution to this uh, is summarized here. So we uh, found that this microRNA, uh, in addition to other targets, uh, binds to 3' prime untranslated region of this uh, RNA binding protein. Uh, this is a this is protein that's uh, called polypyrimidine tract binding protein. So I'm sure that uh, some of you have heard about this protein before. It's also called PTB or HNRNPI. So this protein is uh, uh, in a way famous uh, because it's been identified as a global regulator of neuronal alternative splicing events. So and this is uh, supposed to illustrate this fact. So the, uh, the, the, the picture, therefore, is quite simple. MicroRNA inhibits PTB, but PTB, in turn, uh, is able to repress neuron-specific neuron alternative splicing events. So if you inhibit PTB, you therefore allow neuron-specific uh, alternative exons to be included. And uh, this, in part, we believe, constitutes the, uh, the reason why, uh, why this microRNA uh, is contributing to uh, uh, to neuronal differentiation. But this is a picture to illustrate this fact. So by knocking down PTB it's alone, just PTB, uh, without uh, tr touching other microRNA 124 targets, you start with uh, uh, proliferating neuroblastoma cells and end up with something like this, that uh, uh, neuroblastoma cells projecting very long neurites. Um, th these cells still proliferate, but they do not proliferate as rapidly as these cells. And you can see that the, the, uh, there is a substantial increase, a uh, statistically significant increase in the number of cells uh, which uh, exhibit uh, neuron-like uh, morphology. So this protein is important, the expression of this protein is important to keep cells non-neuronal. So is splicing, is the only, is splicing the only thing that uh, contributes to this uh, phenotype? So we, we carried out a microarray experiment where we knocked down PTB in one, sam in one sample and uh, treated the other sample with control siRNA. And we found that actually, in addition to these events, uh, alternative splicing events, we also detect uh, global changes or uh, overall expression uh, level changes in uh, a number of, F of mRNAs. Uh, so the difference is quite obvious. In one case, just one exon or two exons are changed uh, in, a, in a transcript. But in this case, we found that some mRNAs actually start to be expressed higher when you knock down PTB. And when you analyze those RNAs, they tend to be actually neuronal. So they tend to be mRNAs that you would expect to observe in a, neur in a neuron. So what's, what is the mechanism of that? So of course you can argue you know, all of these effects are fairly unspecific. So to, to find out uh, what is going on, we decided to leave microarray analysis and we, uh, we decided to carry out RNA-seq analysis, nowadays more popular way to look at uh, global changes in the transcriptome. And it turned out to be quite productive. So I'll, I'll tell you uh, our recent story uh, that started from RNA-seq analysis where we treated uh, one uh, tube of cells with, uh, or plate of cells with uh, siRNA against PTB, and the other was control, isolated RNA, uh, compared the two, 
uh, transcriptomes by RNA-seq. This is just a brief reminder how this works. You start with a RNA fragmented. It's just one way of doing this, of course. Uh, you convert the RNA to cDNA, ligate adapters, sequence uh, using, in our case, uh, Illumina machine. And then you align this, the short sequences, the millions of short sequences you obtain from this sample to a reference genome. And of course, what you get is primarily you get reads corresponding to exons because this, w this thing is uh, completely spliced mRNA. And this species accumulated at substantial level. Uh, you also get a little bit of intronic reads. And sometimes you get those junction reads. I'm not going to talk about them uh, in, in, uh, in subsequent slides, but just keep in mind that you get all of this information. So, OK, so you have this. And then the question is, how do you, um, how do you actually uh, deduce the, uh, the, ex the expression levels from this? Uh, and it's, it's fairly simple, really. Uh, so if the, sort of the, the flow of genetic information from transcription to processing to export to accumulation of cytoplasm goes without any interruption, you would get uh, a very large number of exonic reads and just summing up those reads uh, with some, a little bit of bioinformatic tricks, you get uh, some sort of normalized number that would be representing the expression level of uh, this particular transcript. Um, OK, this is valuable, but this is exactly the same thing you can get from microarrays. Uh, but with this type of data, you can also, uh, you can also get uh, additional bit of information, which is quite valuable for us. You can, for example, identify transcripts which are regulated at a level which is, uh, which is below of transcription, at a post-transcriptional level. And the way this works is uh, if transcription goes normally, uh, as, as here, you would get the same number of intronic reads. But if something happens with the mRNA on the way to the cytoplasm, then you would start losing exonic reads because that, that is the main contributor. Uh, splice the RNA is the main contributor for this exonic reads. Uh, therefore, the expectation is that the ratio between intronic and exonic reads would, would go down. Oh, sorry, if you normalize intron to exon, it would go up. So you divide uh, intron by exon. So we, we call this statistic uh, IRENE for intronic reads normalized to exons. This is also uh, uh, why uh, the bioinformatician, our bioinformatician's uh, wife name just happens to be. <laughs> so, OK, so, uh, so now you have these two statistics. Uh, one of them is just expression level. And the other one is this uh, statistic which tells you whether or not there is a post-transcriptional regulation going on. So you can plot changes in both of the statistics uh, and compare between two samples. And what you get is uh, um, you get some of the genes uh, would go up in the transcript abundance. Some of them would go down. But there would be also this other axis where this irene, the likelihood of a gene to be regulated at the post-transcriptional level would also change. So then if you only focus on red dots, which represent uh, statistically significant events in both uh, directions, uh, you see that this, this is somewhat uh, biased towards this diagonal. And this is highly significant uh, bias. So you get uh, what we call them northwest genes because of the obvious reasons. And you also get the southeast genes. Uh, so the northwest genes uh, undergo upregulation when you downregulate PTB. This is how we started this analysis. But, but uh, the fact that they are also highly scoring in this uh, particular direction means that they are likely to be post-transcriptionally regula regulated. So we first focused on these genes because um, when we quickly carried out uh, gene ontology analysis of this group, uh, we noticed a, a highly significant overrepresentation of genes contributing to presynaptic compartment of a neuron. So these genes, which were undergoing upregulation, uh, when PTB was down, were neuronal genes uh, of this particular sort. And this was quite interesting because that, uh, is one of the that would have been one of the examples uh, how one thing can, at, at post-transcriptional le level, regulate a number of genes. So this sort of uh, idea of master regulator at the post-transcriptional level. Um, so just to name them, uh, this is uh, synaptic vesicle markers. Uh, V-snare and T-snare, uh, and, and these are, of course, neuronal genes, which 
zip the uh, synaptic vesicle to the terminal. And of course, the two, two neuron-specific chains of kinesin, uh, this is a molecular motor that brings synaptic vesicle to the terminal in addition to other functions. So it's quite interesting. Um, okay, so we decided to, to look at this group in more detail. So this uh, shows one of the sort of circumstantial data that got us inspired in this even more. Uh, so this shows you a cross-section through a developing mouse brain, medulla, and you can see that the expression of PTB is observed in, uh, in the ventricular part of the uh, neural tube, which, as you remember, the site where neural stem cells reside. So PTB is expressed at high level there, whereas the, uh, these genes, which are potentially targeted by PTB, according to our analysis, are not expressed there. They expressed anywhere else except for this particular uh, area. So they expressed in areas containing mature neurons. So and this is a very nice uh, uh, sort of reciprocal expression pattern you see here for syntaxin and, and, and VAMP uh, too. The, the two proteins that we, ha we happen to have antibodies for. So of course uh, we couldn't look at all of them. And this is a neuronal marker. So this is an, uh, a late neuronal marker uh, microtubule uh, associated protein uh, too. So this uh, provided us with um, circumstantial evidence that we might be on the right track. So PTB might be indeed inhibiting those genes in, uh, in vivo. So we, we, we did a more direct analysis. We treated our cells with siRNAs, and we looked at the protein expression, and we noticed that when you knock down PTB, so this is uh, supposed to illustrate the efficiency of knockdown by using uh, PTB-specific antibodies, uh, you see upregulation of syntaxin and VOM2. And there are some markers here, doesn't matter. Um, so we decided to look at the, uh, so if you did the RNA sec analysis, you would know what it is. This is a, essentially a profile showing you, uh, and something that I already illustrated with these little dashes in one of the previous slides. So these peaks correspond to RNA sec signals. Uh, and this is a gene model, so this is uh, axons showing by thick lines, intron showing by thin lines, so there's 10 axons in this particular gene. I'm going to focus on syntaxin 1b, but uh, pretty much same data we obtained for other genes. So just for simplicity, focusing on one of them. Uh, okay, so there are uh, axons and, uh, my, uh, and RNA sec reads uh, overrepresented, obviously, for this particular areas. There are introns, but you see also some intronic reads. Uh, so obviously this is normalized and you see that the, in the control uh, traded sample the expression of syntaxin is low because there are few reads uh, and in the PTB traded sample the expression is high uh, and this is of course mostly coming from uh, or actually ex almost exclusively coming from uh, exonic reads. So the exonic reads become taller. But one thing was quite interesting here and uh, this suggested a potential me mechanism of regulation. So when we focus here at this red uh, area, this is a blow up of this, we notice uh, a, a reciprocal change. So exonic reads were undergoing upregulation, so I even had to cut this thing to, to be able to show this in a close up. But intronic reads corresponding uh, to the last intron were downregulated upon PTB knockdown. So PTB was doing something uh, directly or indirectly to this intron that might have been uh, uh, linked with the changes in the mRNA uh, abundance. So uh, we tested this, of course, by uh, RT-PCR, just to confirm that what we see by RNA-sec makes sense. Uh, so does PTB inhibit these introns directly or indirectly? And the answer is yes, because when you uh, do uh, RT-PCR analysis using forward and reverse primers shown here to the uh, introns, which were suspected to be uh, changing their splicing efficiency, you would see that you start in the control sample, you start with a lot of uh, intron retained reads, the, the, uh, or species rather, intron retained species, uh, and then when you treat cells with uh, PTB, siRNA, you start losing intron-retained species and you start accumulate uh, intron-spliced species. So this is, I mean, this is RNA, um, um, RT-PCR analysis 
analyzed on agarose gel. It's quite simple. You just detect the difference in size. So obviously, intron retained uh, species would be simply longer, and they would migrate slower in the gel. So this is how we can tell them apart. So this is some quantification of this analysis repeated multiple times. Okay, so uh, at this point we, we, we started to think um, uh, previous data from uh, Phil Sharp lab and uh, Michael Rosbush lab suggested a long time ago, they suggested that uh, incompletely spliced RNA species, which and of course splicing uh, hap is happening in nucleus, uh, then are not allowed to leave the nucleus until the splicing is complete. So we speculated or uh, proposed a, a model that uh, perhaps uh, this particular species, uh, which are not spliced in the presence of PTB, would not be efficiently exported to the cytoplasm. And uh, to, to check this uh, uh, hypothesis, we uh, took mouse neuroblastoma cells and we fractionated them into uh, nuclear and cytoplasmic compartment and we analyzed where those intron retained species that we detect actually reside. And it so happens that this intron uh, retained species reside uh, almost exclusively in the nucleus where a cytoplasmic compartment contains uh, intron splice species. And this is a highly significant uh, difference in the distribution between the two species. So the model therefore, so far, is that the PTB uh, binds somehow to this uh, intron um, um, sequences, uh, potentially, and, and it arrests splicing, therefore uh, keeping the uh, uh, pre-mRNAs or incompletely spliced RNAs in the nucleus. So they, they are made by the polymerase, but they are not allowed to be exported to the cytoplasm. So this is a, a sort of a model for post-transcription regulation. Is it feasible idea? And uh, it, in the case of syntaxin and all, all the other genes indeed, it, it is completely feasible idea because this uh, retained introns that we were looking at contained a number of PTB, um, 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 PTB consensus motifs, sequences where you would expect PTB to bind. So PTB, as the name implies, likes to bind to polypyrimidine rich sequences and I underlined them uh, for you. And the, the ones which are considered classical motifs are highlighted by red. So you can see there's a number of these motifs. It is a, a, a feasible idea. And to test it, we decided to take advantage of a, a, a knock-in system that we developed in the lab, uh, which is based on site-specific recombination. So you start with a cassette that contains two uh, uh, mutually incompatible lock sites but they are compatible with their kind. So for example, this log site would be compatible with this, and log P, the, the wild type log site would be compatible with this. So you can use this uh, together with Cre recombinase, the enzyme that recognizes the sites, to knock in uh, a, a cassette of interest or a gene of interest at a predefined location in the cell. So the only thing you need to do is to make the cell line that contains this uh, docking site, or we call it acceptor locus. And uh, you select the correct uh, cells by just changing antibiotic selection. So you start with blastocytin and you end up with pyromycin resistant cells. So this is a, a similar to commercial systems, but in our hands this one works better. So we just decided to use this one to, um, to engineer mini genes which would uh, hopefully recapitulate the regulation of the endogenous gene and use these mini genes to ask uh, specific questions about cis and trans uh, factors uh, important for the regulation. So we constructed a mini gene and inserted that into a neuroblastoma cell line that we used. Uh, and this mini gene contained a, a tetracycline inducible promoter and uh, really a, a very uh, three prime terminal part of syntaxin gene that contained this regulated intron. So this is the intron between exon nine and, and 10. And uh, uh, for some sort of design purposes, we also included uh, exon eight. So, uh, and this is, show, this is sort of showing the uh, uh, conservation plot and these two uh, areas of PTB uh, consensus motifs that I showed in the previous slide. So, you can see that the first one is actually conserved according to the FASTCONS score, whereas the second one is not conserved but it's quite extensive. 
But the first thing uh, important here is that uh, is the question whether or not this mini gene even recapitulates the regulation of the endogenous gene, and it it, it completely does. So you can see here that uh, measuring the expression of this mini gene uh, in cell street with uh, control of PTB siRNA, you see a dramatic difference in expression, S quite similar to the endogenous syntaxin. Mini gene was undergoing uh, upregulation upon PTB knockdown. Okay, so that was good. So now we could actually address the question about the significance of these sites. So we imitated the first site. Uh, we lost a little bit of upregulation uh, in, in, in terms of fold and p-value. Not the p-value, though. Just folds. Uh, and then um, this, the second site would, was also diminishing regulation. But when we imitated uh, both, uh, both of these PTB, putative PTB binding sites, uh, the regulation was completely gone. So the uh, conclusion from here is quite likely that PTB binds to these sites and uh, freezes the splicing of this intron and this promotes, uh, uh, this, this enables this regulation. The interesting uh, twist here is that when you don't touch the sites but you just touch the uh, five prime splice site here, uh, the regulation is completely gone as well. So, this uh, particular experiment tells you that it's not just the fact of binding of PTB there, but uh, this, this entire block has to be recognized as an intron. So you need to recognize this element as an intron uh, in order to, for regulation to work. Okay? Not, so it's not a simple model where PTB would just bind and retain this thing in the, uh, in the nucleus. It's more likely that PTB binds there and it uh, disables uh, some steps of uh, uh, splicing, and this is recognized as an aberrant form which is not allowed to leave the nucleus. So there is a, a, a very interesting uh, pathway out there which is uh, poorly understood, and we are now trying to understand this uh, in more detail, uh, but I will not have time to show you our extremely preliminary data in this area. I will just summarize this quickly. So. Uh, in both neuronal and non-neuronal cells, uh, the genes uh, which are contributing to presynaptic compartment of neurons are, are transcribed at detectable level, but in the presence of PTB, the uh, 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 sp specific introns inside those genes, uh, regulatory, we can call them the regulatory introns, are not allowed to be spliced out, and uh, the RNA as a consequence is not allowed to leave the nucleus, uh, instead, it undergoes uh, degradation, as our uh, preliminary data suggests, by the nuclear exosome in a manner that depends on the nuclear basket, uh, uh, nuclear pore uh, basket protein uh, T uh, TPR, or ML MLP1, in, uh, using yeast terminology. Uh, when PTB, uh, on the other hand, is downregulated in neurons by microRNA-124, so it showed that PTB is decreasing and microRNA is increasing here, uh, this, this subset of introns can now be spliced out without a problem, and the RNA can travel to the cytoplasm and encode the proteins contributing to presynaptic compartments. So in this case, uh, kinesin and uh, synaptic vesicle markers and the two snare proteins important for the vesicle uh, fusion. Okay, so that's uh, how do in terms of time. I guess we are, okay, so I can show you a little bit more then. Uh, okay, so we can add now to, um, to this original uh, summary slide that I showed you. In addition to repressing uh, uh, neuron-specific splice forms, PTB also regulates uh, the abundance of neuron-specific mRNAs at the, level, uh, at the steady state levels through this uh, intron retention mechanism. So that's what we learned from our screen, uh, rna sec screen. Is there anything else we can learn from this? Uh, as you can see here, there are a number of dots. I only told you about four or five of them. So uh, other genes apparently also regulated at, at some sort of post-transcriptional level. And uh, one of these mechanisms that, uh, it, as it happens, we actually identified this long time ago, but for the sake of presentation, I saved it for later. 
um, is related to a process called nonsense mediated decay. And, uh, and more specifically, uh, alternative splicing coupled nonsense mediated decay. So un un unless you know what nonsense medi mediated decay is, um, it is a, a very interesting cytoplasmic quality control mechanism that identifies mRNAs with premature termination codon, which occur uh, in, the, in the body of the open reading frame. And uh, this process depends on the presence of downstream splice, uh, uh, splice junctions, or they're also called exon-exon junctions, or AJC, EJCs. So this is how it works in mammalian cells. So when this PTC occurs in the body of RNA, EJC, downstream EJCs would signal degradation, and this RNA would be rapidly cleared. So this is, of course, used as a mechanism to identify uh, sporadically appearing uh, mutant mRNAs, but it also uh, it so happens the increasing uh, uh, body of evidence suggests that it, it is also used as a natural mechanism for regulating mRNA abundance in a developmentally regulated manner. So uh, in here I show you the diagram of uh, one potential scenario. This is a scenario involving so-called open reading frame maintaining exons. So in this case, uh, an exon which, uh, which is, uh, whose length is not divisible by three, therefore this exon, when it's included or skipped, this would change the open reading frame. Uh, when it's included, the translation is, uh, uh, the, the open reading frame is complete. The translation goes from start to the natural stop. But when the exon is skipped, the open reading frame is broken and uh, premature termination codon occurs immediately downstream or uh, a short distance downstream of, uh, of this uh, newly formed exon-exon junction. So in this case, the species would undergo uh, nonsense mediated decay. And it so happens that uh, amongst those dots which were undergoing upregulation, there were two genes uh, which were previously showed uh, to, to be regulated by PTB in this particular manner. So in this case, in the presence of PTB, uh, regulatory axons, uh, open reading framing maintaining axons, would be skipped and this RNAs would be undergoing uh, cytoplasmic decay, uh, cytoplasmic nonsense mediated decay in the presence of PTB. When you knock down PTB by microRNA 124, as it happens in neurons, this axons would now be allowed to, uh, to be included uh, because PTB is simply not there to stop this from happening. So, and this would lead to accumulation of uh, two proteins. And one of them is a cousin of PTB, uh, also known as neuronal PTB. So, the name, as the name implies, it's one of the neuronal proteins. The other protein is a uh, GABA receptor subunit. And, and this is a, a, another good example of neuronal protein because uh, this is a, a receptor contributing to inhibitory synapses. Okay. So, we can add to this diagram yet another uh, uh, link where PTB would be repressing uh, exons that, that are important for maintaining open reading frame. And uh, at least in two examples, we have two examples now, and uh, uh, work published recently from other labs suggests that it's not, not the only two examples um, of, of this particular regulation. So alternative splicing changes, uh, primarily inhibiting neuron-specific axons. Uh, expression level changes mediated through uh, nuclear quality control mechanism. And finally, uh, expression level changes mediated by cytoplasmic control mechanism. And this is all orchestrated by, by a single protein. It's quite impressive. This is a summary uh, in words. And uh, for the really take home message here, uh, if you forget all or most of what I, uh, I said, this would be a nice sort of uh, thing to bring home. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Central Dogma of Molecular Biology uh, circa 1985, where DNA is, uh, information is transferred to RNA, to protein in a unidirectional manner. Uh, now the increasing uh, body of evidence suggests that this model has to look like this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, the, so the, when you have the RNA, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a protein. And uh, now with the discovery of uh, long non-coding RNAs, uh, this is even more true because no, uh, things which, uh, which are encoded in the genome do not always encode proteins. But even if they do, as I showed you in this uh, presentation, not necessarily this ends up in protein. Thank you. And this is the uh, people who contributed to this, Fursham and Karen were the first uh, uh, authors, the main authors on uh, this manuscripts and paper. Uh, and there, there are other people in the lab working on, on other projects. Uh, uh, quite substantial collaboration was from uh, Brett Friedman, whose wife name you now know, it's Irene. Uh, and the funding was provided by National Research Foundation and uh, uh, NTU. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>